Hey sports fans, Coach Nick here and welcome to B-Ball Breakdown. Today I'm happy to have Jared Zwirling of Bleacher Report, an NBA writer there who does terrific stuff, so make sure to check him out on Twitter and on the .com side. Uh, Jared, we had the opportunity to hang out a little bit in Chicago during the Combine, and uh, I was hoping to get a little uh, some insight from you into uh, what you thought, how it went. No, it was great. I mean, obviously, the most important thing is the networking. I mean, you see the scouts there, the GMs, and you have to be friendly, kind of schmooze a little bit. But that, that's just great to see, you know, even like seeing Jerry Sloan scout. I don't think he left his post for like two days. <laughs> He's had the same seat, right? Of course, not. so that's the best thing, just meeting faces that you hear about around the NBA, like like talking to you, Nick, you know, for example. So that was great. And you, you get good perspective on the draft because, you know, let, let's face it. I mean, I cover the NBA, and so my focus is – the day to day of the NBA, I don't follow these draft guys all the all the time, so it's good to kind of feel out some things and kind of what what what's hot, what's not. Um, you know, as far as players go, very interested to see Dante Exum. Of course, I spent a week with him in Australia in December, filming a documentary, a bunch of stories for our website Bleacher Report. So that was the first time I saw him really in those drills. I had seen him play five on five, which he didn't do with the combine. So I thought he tested very well. He stumbled once, I think, in the lane agility test, but you know he had the best. He had one of the best times in that. He had a 35-inch vertical. So athletically, he tested very well, and I thought he handled himself very well in the interviews. I think he had the most reporters around him. I probably, he probably had, like, maybe 40 reporters, but he was he handled himself with employees and answered every question well. And so that was great to see. I think the second thing is Zach Levine from UCLA. I thought he shot the ball very well. I was curious to see how his off, his left hand, uh, guide hand would look, and I thought he kind of uh, had good release point, good, good high arc. Uh, you know, is he going to play point guard or shooting guard at the next level? We'll find out, but I thought his shot looked very good, very good footwork, so I thought he improved his draft stock pretty well. Wow, well, speaking of shooters, I had a chance to watch McDermott uh, really close up and also Nick Stauskas, and it, what, speaking of scouting, uh, what was interesting was a guy like Jerry West would come in there, and he is talking to everybody and whatever, and he would sit down, and he had the, he had the newspaper, and it's kind of funny to watch somebody actually read the newsprint still, but he, would, he was just reading it, and then all of a sudden, Stouts just went to start warming up, and you could see he put it down and stood up there and really watched him uh, carefully to see. So, uh, yeah, those are those moments when you can just look around, because quite honestly, I felt like in the drills that they had, and I think a lot of people got to see that on TV as well, you know, it's really hard to get glean too much from what they're doing there without them actually competing yep. in a five-on-five -five setting. Wouldn't you agree? I totally agree. I had breakfast with Steve Hess. He's the Nuggets strength and conditioning coach for the last 18 years. And he's worked in the combine for the last 18 years as well. And he told me, Jared, you get a little snapshot of guys. But, you know, what he told me is that when, when he works with guys in those different tests, he sees how guys put out their hard work. He sees guys that like, take it to the next max. He, he, has, he has some guys that come up to him and say, hey, what's, what's, the, what's the highest level? What's, what's the max? I want to beat that. So little things like that, the competitiveness, the competitive spirit, you know, I want to beat this guy. Uh, in drills, you know, you, you have to watch for the footwork for sure. Are they fluid? Are they, are they too uptight? Are they taking an extra step? They shouldn't be taking an extra step. Are they going really hard? And even though it's five on five, you can take a lot of things away with fluidity, with uh, precision, the jump shot for sure. I mean, that, that to me is probably the biggest thing with the combine is how well guys shoot the ball. I mean, the NBA now, as you know, Nick, it's a three-point game and dunk. But for the most part, you got to be a good shooter now. And so I, I, I want to see all these guys shoot the ball. And you, spill, you, you talked about Nick Stauskas, great point you make about how good he's become. You know, the mid-range game in the NBA now is not the biggest asset or not the, not the, not the thing that all these guys have right away. They have the speed, athleticism, but mid-range game. Look at John Wall, for example. So guys developed that towards the end of maybe the next two three years. So it was interesting to see how these guys hit mid-range jump shots. Not a lot of great shooting on the mid-range. Three-point shot shooting looked good, but I want to see how these guys kind of take it to the next level from the 15 to 20-foot range on the next level. Did anybody uh, else jump out at you that might have been a, a sleeper we don't know about? I would say Noah Vonley. Not really a sleeper, though, but he could be maybe even a top three pick, honestly. I mean, he's got all the tools. Uh, you know, he can stretch out the court. Um, you know, he's going to get even better. I mean, he has to build his body up, but I, I, he has a, a very high projection to me. I don't think he'll go top three, but he has that that talent. I mean, he tested off off the roof to me. So I, maybe him. Um, you know, I, well, one guy I think that will be very good the next level is Tyler Ennis. He's not in the top 10, not top, maybe not in top 15. But, you know, one thing about Tyler, he doesn't play a very fast game, which is not really the NBA game, but he's very efficient. And I think he'll work very well for maybe a playoff team, coming off the bench, really uh, running the team very well, very smoothly. I, I, he's a very precision point guard to me. And 
even though he's precise, he's also very creative and he's a very good leader. He speaks very well. He studies the game a lot. He talked about studying film with Chris Paul and Tony Parker. So I like him a lot. I think I think he's going to be a very interesting point guard on the next level. Even though, you know, even though he's not very fast, I think he has the right assets to be a very good uh, floor general, maybe off the bench. Well, let's pivot to the draft because we just had the ping pong balls uh, flying and, we, and they all sort of laid out. Uh, I, I had said that the conspiracy theory was the Lakers and Celtics would get two of the top three picks if there was a conspiracy, and it didn't happen, but uh, the uh, Le Cleveland Cavaliers got it. So what are yeah. your thoughts on that? Were you getting hammered on Twitter by all these conspiracy theorists? <laughs> It's crazy, right? I mean, all the Cavaliers fans uh, lost LeBron James, so it's like uh, well wishes for them, for a burning franchise that needs to win. I mean, last year they had a disappointing year. They didn't make the playoffs. They should have. They had a bust in Anthony Bennett. So, number one pick again, they have to make a splash. I mean, I know a lot of talk about Joel, Joel Embiid, and he's talented for sure, but he has that lower back issue, which is a question mark. Remember, remember Greg Oden a couple years ago? Went number one, look at him now. So, I don't know if big guys are the best guys to draft so high. I mean, big guys in the NBA take a longer, t- longer time to develop. You know, they're the anchors on the defense. They have to call out screens, and they have to offensively set screens. Uh, uh, you know, there's so much more uh, for a big guy to develop physicality-wise. Plus, these guys grow into their body so quickly. They go from, like, 6'5 to 6'10. They have these crazy growth spurts. Sometimes they're not used to growing into their own body. But with, with the NBA now, it's such a, fast, a fast-paced fast game. You have to go guard forward, I think, top three. To me, Jabari Parker is the guy. He's most NBA-ready. He has the size. Uh, he can step out and shoot it, which is a great asset to have. When you have Deion Waiters and Kyrie Irving, you know, have a guy shooting threes is huge. Plus, he can play inside. Uh, he has a great second jump off offensive rebounds. He's physical inside. So, I like what he brings. He's very, he's like, to me, he's the best versatile, most NBA-ready player in this draft. And I think he compliments those Cavaliers guys very, very well. Absolutely. I mean, I, I would love to argue with you when we can start shouting about who should be number one. But <laughs> Parker is that guy, the most polished guy I've seen. And, uh you know, what do you think? I think that Wiggins is a guy who probably should have stayed in school for another year to really polish his game. Um, but what are you hearing? Is he going to end up going top two? I think so. You know, the thing with Wiggins is this. Is I think the biggest knock about him is that he's not intense a lot. He kind of looks quiet at times. And, you know, you want to see that Kobe Bryant fire out of him, like really get after it. And he, you know, he's a very friendly guy. He's a very private guy. You know, he needs a lot of media training on the next level for sure. <laughs> so I think Wiggins going to the NBA now is actually a smart move for him because he'll learn quickly what it takes to be aggressive, physical. I don't know, I don't know if another year in college would really do it because he's so talented. I just think, I think he needs to be around NBA guys that are bigger than him. It may not be as skilled or, or athletic as him, but he needs to be around the NBA environment, going through the travel schedule, going from one city to the next city. And really, I, I, he has to me, he has the biggest upside out of anybody in this draft. Can be as can be can be as good as Tracy McGrady, or maybe Vince Carter, or as low as maybe like a Jerry Stackhouse. I, I mean, he has a very very high ceiling to me out of anybody in this draft because, I, as you saw, that photo he took, you put on Instagram of his 44 inch vertical leap and. You know, he has the, the dribbling moves. His jump shot needs some work for sure, which Parker has. That's why I put Parker above Wiggins because he has the jump shot. Mm-hmm. But Wiggins, I mean, just he's a physical specimen, freak of nature. I think he has the biggest, biggest upside in this draft. Uh, I've been hearing a little bit through the grapevine for one guy who seems to be in the know that Dante Exum was, is that impressive and might sneak into that top top yep. slot maybe. I mean, I don't know. Here, I guess the problem with Cleveland is they already have their point guard. Um, and they already have waiters, and they don't move him. So um, are there any deals that you're hearing about that might be coming down the pipeline? Not really deals yet, but Exxon is an interesting you know, player in this draft. I, like I said, I spent time with him in Australia. He's an enigma for sure. You know, he, he won't be working out for too many teams, and when he does work out, he's not going to do too much. He might have one other player there in the draft or in the workout with him. Uh, I talked to, um, what's his name, uh, Andrew Bogut's agent, um, I believe David Bauman. When he came into the draft in 2005, Andrew's, Andrew Bogut's workouts were very limited. I know he played one year at Utah, but he was still an enigma. I mean, he only worked out with Marvin Williams at the time. Not a lot of stuff that he was doing, a lot of simple stuff. So he'll be an enigma all the way through the draft. I mean, teams have scouted him for sure. There's a book on him. I was in Australia. The competition out there is not very good. Big guys are maybe six foot six. So the NBA game will be a huge surprise for him. So a big adjustment. But he does have all the physical tools. He can play both guard positions. His jump shots are work in progress, but he's definitely evolved with that. I mean, to me, it's going to be the magic because I mean, a couple of reasons. One, in Australia, he told me the two places that he would like to play for is is the Lakers and the Magic. The Lakers are interesting because of Kobe Bryant, uh, who is also represented by uh, the same agent as Dante Exum, Rob Polinka. And he's, uh, he's been training out in L.A. The second thing with the Magic, uh, Victor Oladipo, him and, him and Dante are very good friends. They met 
uh, during Dante's recruiting visit to Indiana. They've hit it off. They want to play together for sure. I think Dante and Oliva will be great kind of slotting off the one-two position. Jameer Nelson is in Orlando, but look, let's face it, Jameer is on his way out, unfortunately, in his career. They need some. Uh, they need an upgrade at point guard. So Dante makes a lot of sense uh, in Orlando, and also the Utah Jazz at five. Um, you know, I know they had Trey Burke there, but Nick, it's become the NBA has also become a two-point guard league, where teams are now utilizing the. Uh, you look at the look at the Nets this past season with Darren Williams and Sean Livingston. So the two-point guard lineup is very valuable in the NBA today. You get more speed on the court, more penetration. So maybe you could see a. Trey Burke, uh, Dante Exum lineup, as well as Oladipo and Exum as well in Orlando. Absolutely. And Exum, I, I spoke to him and stood next to him. He is a legit 6'6". So he could definitely be a, like a combo guard who can guard two guards. So uh, I, I don't know. I, I, uh, the one thing that was funny in, at the, in Chicago was that he didn't even touch the ball. Like it would roll by him and he wouldn't even look at it. Like obviously under strict orders, don't even – because he was doing the running part a little bit, but he would not <laughs> touch the ball. And uh, I just wanted to see how his finger – how he handled it a little bit. I couldn't even see that. So uh, I guess the summer league might be an opportunity. Hopefully, maybe by that point, we'll, we'll get summer to see him on the sure. court. Yeah, no, summer league for sure. I mean, his agents, Rob Plink and Brendan Rosenthal, they're, they're good guys. I know them both. But, you know, it's a very sensitive process because you're dealing with the guy who has so much hype uh, internationally. And a lot of people here in the States don't really know so much about him. But they kind of do now because of all this hype. You know, we live in a different world now with social media and Twitter, Instagram. You know, 10 years ago when LeBron came out of the draft or, or now 11 years ago, there was all that. Uh, there was none of that social media, none of that stuff. Now, uh, you know, there is. So that stuff can elevate a player even though he hasn't even played any basketball. So, you know, he, he's going to be an interesting guy to watch. I mean, if you go back to the Nike Hoop Summit last year, Nick, uh, when he played in Portland against Parker and Wiggins, he was great. I mean, off the dribble, he has a very quick first step. He's very good at attacking the rim. You know, the shot has to improve, and also defensively, which is which is funny because in Australia, they actually call him Ante Exum because there's no D in his name. So they joke with him about that there, that he's not a great defender yet. Um, again, he has to bulk up, and he has to get used to the NBA grind and the NBA physicality level. But, I mean, he's also another guy who could be as maybe as good as Russell Westbrook or maybe as good as, or maybe the lower ceiling, maybe like a, um, well, you know, Michael Carter-Williams, but he's going to be good. But maybe maybe Michael Carter-Williams and maybe as high as Russell Westbrook, maybe that's his range. Wow. Well, that's really heady stuff and interesting take on a lot of these things. Uh, Jerry, thanks for joining us on the show. And uh, make sure, sports fans, to follow him on Twitter. He's always got great stuff there and over at Bleacher Report. And uh, don't forget, at B-Ball Breakdown, we're not a channel. We're a conversation. You in? Are you in, Jared? I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs>